here's Ed Bernstein. Hi, welcome to our show today. My guest is Congressman Ruben Kiwan. I, I, you know, it's interesting. I get to call you a congressman. Yes, right? sir. I mean, it was before it was a state senator and uh, then candidate, but you're, you're finally back. It's coming back from Congress for your first six-month experience there. That's right. Ed, but well, what, always yeah. call me Ruben, though, no congressman. Oh, what was it like, Ruben? Uh, well, look, it, it, this is the greatest honor of my life uh, to be able to serve in Congress. Uh, but I understand that with this honor comes a big responsibility. Uh, and I think it goes without saying, you know, uh, there's a lot of problems right now in our country. Our country is divided. Republicans and Democrats are not talking to each other. Uh, this administration um, is not talking to Congress. Uh, it's a very, very hostile environment right now in Washington, D.C., but uh, we have our work cut out for us, and, and it's, it's a huge honor to be able to represent Nevada and Washington, D.C. Uh, and because of all those problems, you know, I'm, not, I'm thinking to myself, Okay, I mean, you, you know what's going on in the Senate because you see it on CNN and, and on the cable news networks. But you don't really see what's going on day to day in the House other than you keep getting feedback that nothing is getting passed. Right. Right? So what, so what you wake up in the morning, on a Tuesday morning, what's really going on in the House? Uh, a, a whole lot of nothing, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, you know, I come from a state legislature. As you know, I was a state senator and a state assemblyman. Mm -hmm. I come from a state legislature where Republicans and Democrats would sit down uh, along with the governor, the Republican governor, Brian Sandoval, and we would sit down, have our differences, but come up with a compromise bill. Uh, we will work together for the sake of our state. Uh, unfortunately, things don't work out that way in, in, in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, right now you have Republicans and Democrats who um, are not talking to each other. This is not the same Washington, D.C. of, you know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, where members would uh, debate on the floor, mm -hmm. and then they would leave and have dinner and then, you know, resolve their differences. Right. This Washington, D.C. right now is very divided. Um, you know, in the, in the past eight months that we've been in Congress, not one significant piece of legislation has been signed into law. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act and, uh, you know, uh, the, the Russian investigation. I believe that we should be focusing on infrastructure, on jobs, on the economy, on fixing the Affordable Care Act instead of getting rid of it. Uh, and these are issues that we just haven't talked about. And it seems like the American public is in favor of all those things. But Absolutely. in spite of that, it never changes. Right. I mean, the Affordable Care Act, I think, is a perfect example, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we had uh, the, the, the administration, Donald Trump and the Republicans, trying to repeal it. Uh, and here in Nevada, 210,000 people now have health coverage that, thanks to the uh, Medicaid expansion. And, you know, if you repeal the Affordable Care Act, that's 210,000 people. They're not going to have health coverage here in Nevada. And the state of Nevada cannot afford to give them coverage. Mm -hmm. And so it was very disappointing to see that instead of trying to fix the Affordable Care Act and trying to fix all the bad things with it, uh, that they were just trying to get rid of it without having a replacement. Well, why, why don't the Democrats just come up with that repair bill and stick it out there and see what happens? And, you know, we are in the minority, as you know. Uh, Democrats don't control the, uh, the, the, the White House. We don't control the House or the Senate. Um, we've been reaching out to the Republicans, trying to uh, offer amendments. Um, I offered an amendment to protect uh, Medicaid uh, providers. Uh, it didn't even get a hearing. It didn't even get uh, consideration. Uh, and that's disappointing because, again, health coverage, um, you know, the economy, infrastructure, these are not partisan issues, right? Uh, these are not Republican or Democratic issues. These are American issues. Uh, and that's what we should be focused on. But, again, uh, I'm willing to sit down at the table. Democrats are willing to come to the table. But if the other side's not willing to come, then you can't but, get anything and, done. And you know what's kind of annoying about that is that, is that we're stuck on words that people have said in the past. Now, you listen to the news, you listen to what Donald Trump always, you know, contradicting things he said in the past, and people seem not to have a problem with it, right. at least a lot of his base. But when it <clears> comes <throat> to what the Republicans in the past having said, uh, repeal and replace, repeal and replace, well, life changes, things change, the environment changes. That was then. Now we're here. So how do we do the best job we can do here? And nobody looks at it that way. Right. And, and look, it, if you look at what the Republicans have been saying for the last seven years, it was, re, you know, repeal the Affordable Care Act. They've been campaigning on it for the right. last seven years. And they finally get control of the House, the Senate, and, and the administration. Um, and they can't even come up with the bill that will uh, uh, successfully replace it with something uh, substantive and something good for America. Uh, but now, you know, let's put that aside. Um, you know, as of right now, the, the repeal is dead. Um, you know, we obviously shouldn't uh, sit here and claim victory because at any given moment they can get the votes and pass it out. 
Uh, but we, we should be focusing on fixing the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I am willing to, to reach out to the Republicans and say, look, what do you want fixed out of the Affordable Care Act? What is wrong with this? Uh, let, let's come up with a bill, a bipartisan bill. Let's pass it. Uh, and again, at the end of the day, this is not about Republicans or Democrats. This is about helping Americans who don't have health coverage, uh, and especially here in Nevada. It's a high amount of, of people who are still uninsured. Right, but it, does it always come down to a, a degree of money? Because when you talk about what's wrong with it, what's wrong with it is that the insurance companies are pulling out of certain counties, even in Nevada, they're pulling right. out of uh, of some of the cow counties in, in Nevada. Right. Um, and they're pulling out because uh, they're not making money in those areas, I assume, at right. the, at the, and the premiums are getting too high for certain individuals in certain areas. Right. So the Republican plan is, hey, there's not enough money, so let's take more money out. <laughs> You know, exactly. Which doesn't even make sense. Right. So, I mean, it seemed to me like, hey, how do we put more efficiencies in? How do we raise a little money out of somewhere else, whether it's, you know, somebody paying some tax or whatever it is, and right. make it work? Right. Well, you know, for example, with the Yucca Mountain Project, right? Right. Um, there well, and let's talk, let's sure. give some background on that first. Yeah, I know yeah, that yeah. that's become a big issue again. For a lot of years, the federal government's been trying to put a nuclear uh, dump site here in Nevada, which means traveling from different parts of the country into Yucca Mountain. Harry Reid, while he was in um, the U.S. Senate, mm -hmm. did a tremendous job of making sure that really never came up for a vote. Right. Right? Harry left, and it's kind of like uh, there's a Republican, seems like there's a Republican movement, hey, let's right. screw Harry in Nevada yeah. Yeah, yeah. and get this thing back on. Right. So, you know, so this is a project that for many years has been dead, right? Yucca Mountain, for almost 20 years, has been inactive. Um, I actually just took a tour of Yucca Mountain uh, a couple of months ago. I went out there. I mean, you literally still see machines that are 20 years old that have not been moved in 20 years. Uh, and all of a sudden, as you alluded to, Senator Reid retires. Uh, he had been defunding the project for those 20 plus years. Right. Uh, and Shimkus, the chairman of the subcommittee, decided to resurrect the project. And now they've allocated $120 million in the budget to resurrect the project. Now, again, going back to the point that you were saying, you know, how can we find $120 million for a project uh, to bring nuclear waste to Nevada, you know, our nation's nuclear waste, but we can't find it to give coverage to people? Uh, you know, it's disappointing. They're also talking about, you know, investing billions of dollars in, in building a wall uh, that's not going to work uh, to keep people out, out, out of our country. Uh, why not invest those $20 billion in infrastructure to rebuild our schools, our bridges, our roads, and put people back to work? Um, so I, I think the priorities right now of Congress are in the wrong place. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we can work together. There's still plenty of time for Democrats and Republicans to work together. And, and the irony, and we'll come back to immigration yeah. in a minute, but the irony of building the wall to keep, you know, certain people out, the irony is that the people they're trying to keep out are the people who are really competent to build the wall. <laughs> but, exactly. But, yeah. but getting back to Yucca Mountain, yeah. so, how, so what is the strategy now to stop it? So we, you know, this is almost a fully bipartisan effort uh, from our congressional delegation here in Nevada. Uh, you know, a few months back when Shimkus decided to give this a hearing, uh, not one Nevada representative was in the committee. So I sent him a letter and said, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would appreciate an opportunity to testify in front of your committee mm -hmm. uh, to give you my point of view or a point of view from a Nevadan and why we oppose it. Uh, and, and I was joined by some of my colleagues uh, during that testimony. And we presented the case. The bottom line is, look, you know, this is not just a Nevada issue. All of the other states, 44 other states uh, who generate uh, nuclear waste have to ship their nuclear waste to Nevada, which means that it has to go through all those states. And we're going to become susceptible to some sort of, you know, terrorist attack or an accident. Uh, and we're not talking about low, low level nuclear waste. This is some very high level toxic nuclear waste. If you were to spill it right here on the, you know, near the strip, that would deter uh, people from coming to Nevada, it would be hurtful for our economy. Uh, and so our strategy now moving forward is to continue speaking up, uh, continue testifying in front of the committee, sending letters to the chairman, uh, having Nevadans speak out against this. Because, uh, look, there's still an opportunity for us to defeat this project. It's not a done deal. Uh, you know, and plus, if you include uh, uh, the, the legal process, um, this could take up to another 10 years before they start shipping things. I know Governor Sandoval has been very, very active in opposing this. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator Dean Heller has been opposed to it. Jackie Rosen, Catherine Cortez, Dina Titus, and myself have been uh, fighting in a, in a bipartisan way to, to, uh, to make sure we keep this out. But the bottom line is this. I mean, if you're generating this in your state, you should keep it in your state. Figure a way to keep it in your own backyard, right? But what, what they're doing right now is they're saying, 
we're generating all this trash, all this nuclear waste, and we're going to send it to your backyard. Think about your neighbors, right? If you, all your neighbors all of a sudden grabbed their trash in the recycle bins and took them to your backyard for no reason. Um, and, and bottom line is that the Yucca Mountain is very close to here. It's uh, surrounded by seismic uh, uh, activity. Uh, activity. And, and at any given moment, if there is a very serious earthquake, uh, all of this stuff uh, could be a risk, and, and, and our lives could be a risk as well. Well, I, look, I think the important thing is you have, is have it moving through so many states, and right. most states have to have an interest in making sure their roads are safe. Look, I'm in the accident business. It will happen. Yeah. If they allow it, accidents will happen. Right. And the repercussions, as you said, uh, it could, could be really devastating, particularly right. for a tourist destination like Las Vegas. Exactly. Immigration. Uh, very dear to your heart. Why? I'm the son of immigrants. Uh, I am an immigrant myself. Um, you know, my family came to America when I was eight years old. Uh, I didn't choose to come to America. Uh, my father just didn't see a future for his kids in Mexico, where, where I was born. Uh, you know, my dad wanted a piece of the land of opportunity. He wanted to come to America. He wanted to achieve the American dream. Uh, and he, only, he knew that only that was possible in the United States of America. So my dad sacrificed his life and his career. He was a teacher in Mexico to come to the U.S. And when he came here, he picked strawberries. He did all kinds of odd jobs. He didn't ask for a handout. All he wanted was to hand up, you know, give him an opportunity to go out there and, and work. And he took advantage of those opportunities that only America offers. And, uh, you know, a little less than 30 years later, one of his sons is a member of Congress, right? Uh, I became one of the only immigrants to ever serve in the United States House of Representatives, uh, the first former undocumented immigrant also to serve in, 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 uh, in the U.S. House of Representatives. So it goes to show you that not all immigrants are criminals and rapists, as Donald Trump has said. Um, you know, most of us are hardworking people who are contributing to this economy. And I find it ironic, Ed, that um, the president is the son of immigrants. Um, you know, his wife is an immigrant. Uh, yet, you know, he came to America, his family came to America, got an opportunity to succeed, and now he wants to shut the door on everybody else. And I agree, look, if, if somebody's a criminal or rapist, obviously we don't want them in this country. They should be deported, they should be in jail. But most of the immigrants that I know are hardworking people who contribute to this economy, who contribute to our, our country in a good way, and they should have an opportunity to sit. Now, it's got to be an earned opportunity, right? They got to learn English, stand in back of the line, pay any back taxes, pa uh, pass a backgrounds check. Um, but they should also have an opportunity to become citizens. Hey, look, isn't it a win-win? Because um, you have a kind of a, uh, a a class of people who are working in America, who are not documented. Mm -hmm. who are um, probably using uh, phony social security numbers and, um, and not really contributing, or some of them are not using, or just getting paid cash, right? Yeah. So aren't we losing a lot of tax revenue by not um, authorizing them in some manner to, to work in the country and to be in the country? I mean, it seems to me like it's a two-pronged um, situation. That, one, how do we get immigrants to be um, lawfully in the United States, mm -hmm. being good citizens, paying taxes, blah, right. blah, blah. We can figure that out. Then how they get to a road to citizenship may be a, a secondary issue sure. that we can resolve after the first one. But we're, it seems like we're trying to resolve the whole thing at once and it's really dividing everybody. Right. And I think, you know, the right approach uh, was taken back in 2013 uh, when the Gang of Eight, uh, that include John McCain, Lindsey Graham, Marco Rubio, mm -hmm. uh, Marco Rubio, Tea Party Republican, uh, they all came together and passed an immigration reform bill with 60 plus votes in the Senate. And then it went to the House and the Republican uh, leadership there, John Boehner, refused to give it a vote. That was a bill, again, that touched on a lot of things that you talk about. Uh, you know, it, it, again, if somebody was a criminal rapist, obviously they would not be able to apply. They wouldn't be allowed in this right. country. It included border security. Uh, it included protecting our borders, uh, having to learn English, standing back of the line, pay a back fines or a pay a fine, pay any back taxes, but with the path to citizenship. You know, so it's, people had to earn this. It wasn't just a blanket amnesty for everybody. Uh, it was an earned path to citizenship. But the way that we're talking about it now, that we went from talking about possibly passing immigration reform to now just deporting innocent people. And that's what you're seeing right now in many states, that you know, the ICE agents are showing up to people's homes, you know, literally dragging them out, putting them in back of trucks and deporting them without due process, uh, without even knowing if they're criminals or not.
It's been outrageous. My law firm helps fund a program at the UNLV mm -hmm. Boyd Law School to provide attorneys and counseling to children that are brought before, sometimes as young as four years old, yeah. that are brought into a court and uh, and sent out of the country without due process, without a hearing. Sometimes they're not even, they're, I mean, they're four or six years old, they don't even understand what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and look, it, people like my, I yeah. mean, I came here at eight years old. My, I didn't choose to come here, uh -huh. right? My father, he decided, I want a better future for my kids, so I'm gonna bring them to America. Uh, but he had he not done that, had he not made that sacrifice, I wouldn't be here where, where I am today. I wouldn't be a member of Congress contributing positively to this economy, you know, making the loss for this country and representing the greatest state in the country, right? Um, this has given me the opportunity. I know that if you give an opportunity to an immigrant family that is willing to work hard for it, uh, they will succeed as well. But isn't, Ruben, isn't the elephant in the room that it seems that this is really basically a Republican issue? And the Republicans don't want it to go away because they really don't want people like Reuben Kewin to grow up, become a citizen, and vote because they're afraid you're going to vote Democratic. And it shouldn't be. And it seems to me that, you know, and particularly back when President Obama was the president, uh, part of the reason why John Boehner didn't give that immigration reform bill of 2013 a vote was because they knew that if those 11 million people became legalized and eventually citizens, mm -hmm. that they would say, hey, it was Barack Obama who gave me my citizenship, so I'm gonna become a, a Democrat. Right. Bottom line is, they probably would. And so part of it is politics, uh, but at the end of the day, this shouldn't be a political game. You know, we're talking about innocent people's lives, people who are working hard in this country. I mean, they're our neighbors, our friends, they're the kids, you know, our, the friends of our kids. Uh, they should have an opportunity to succeed. I mean, there, there's no such thing as a Canadian dream or a Mexican dream. There's the American dream. And, 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 and that is only possible in this country if you're willing to work hard for it. And these folks have proven, and they're proving, that they're willing to work hard for it. You know, you, you, I mean, you're new in Congress, so um, there's a lot of issues around the world that uh, we're dealing with right now. What do you, what do you have to do to get up to, to speed on what those issues are? So I get to serve on, 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 on the Financial Services Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an exclusive committee, so this is actually the, the, the only committee that I serve on with the subcommittee on housing and uh, illicit funding and terrorism, uh, basically trying to cut the funding for any terrorist groups across the country. Um, I've learned a lot in Congress. You know, I'm not, I'm not a know-it-all. Um, I don't pretend to know everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I come from a state legislature where we didn't uh, know much about foreign issues. Uh, but in those eight months that I've been in Congress, um, you know, we've had very uh, uh, high-level classified briefings, uh, all the way from the, the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff to the, the different secretaries and, and, and Army generals and, 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 uh, and so on and so on. And so mm -hmm. you get to learn firsthand what those issues are. Uh, you know, you get to learn about why, why are we in this conflict with North Korea? Uh, why are, you know, what is our role with the Middle East uh, 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 fight that's going on right now, that's been going on for, for hundreds of years? Uh, and, you know, what is our role in, in, in around the world? So, you know, you get to sit down and, 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 uh, and, and, and have conversations with other members of Congress who have been there longer than you uh, and learn from them. At the end of the day, you know, uh, the more uh, relationships you build, the, the more information you have, uh, the better decisions you're able to make. Who do you look um, toward in, uh, in Congress as mentors for you? Well, you know, um, we've had uh, a lot of, I've had, a, I've, I've been blessed to have a lot of friends, um, you know, in Congress uh, in this, pre, you know, past eight months. Uh, Javier Becerra was one of them. Uh, he was the chairman of the House Democrats, uh, but then he got appointed uh, as the Attorney General of California. Uh, Joe Crowley uh, has been now a person that I go to and ask for advice. Uh, you know, there's uh, Tony Cardenas from California as well. Uh, he's been very helpful um, in just giving me insight, you know, from somebody who's only been there three terms. Uh, but again, you kind of pick and choose, right? Um, you know, I, I, I'm a proud Democrat um, and I stand, you know, uh, I, I'm, I proudly stand behind my values and my principles and beliefs. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I also like to reach out across the aisle. I don't mind working with Republicans to try to come up with solutions, which is the reason why almost every one of my bills in Carson City when I was a state senator passed, because I was able to reach out to the governor, who was a Republican, 
uh, and to the Republican leadership and be able to pass bills. And I think that's the same approach that we should be taking in Washington, D.C., that not enough elected officials are taking. Right now, people are saying, I'm a Democrat, you're a Republican, we can't talk to each other. And that's unacceptable. You know, I think for the most part, the American people want us to come together, work together. Even Democrats, uh, from my, my, my uh, side of the party, they want us to work together and come up with solutions. Well, look, you, you've seen it work in the Nevada legislature, right. as, you, as you indicated, it works in our county commission and our city council. Correct. And, and is that because, you know, you're all, you know, living in the same state and you kind of see each other out to dinner and, yeah. and, and you know, you have relationships with people in, in the state Senate. I mean, you alluded to this in the beginning of the right. show, but in Washington, you don't have that. You're, I mean, especially you, I mean, you're traveling east to west every week, basically. Yeah, yeah. Right? You're going home Friday, Saturday, Sunday, so you're not there on weekends. You're here, you know, dealing with constituency issues right. instead right. of you know, schmoozing in, in, yeah. uh, in Washington. Right. So it, may, it seems to me to be a problem. Yeah, it definitely. Um, you know, from what I've heard back in the day in Washington, D.C., when the approval rating was a little bit higher, you know, Democrats and Republicans would debate on the House floor, on the Senate floor. Then they would go ahead and have dinner, um, you know, and be courteous right. with each other and get to know each other's families. Nowadays, everybody is in a rush to raise money. Uh, you know, that's part of the reason why we got to take money out of politics. Uh, you know, we should have public financed uh, campaigns, right? Instead of having to go and beg money for corporations and multimillionaires, uh, you know, we should have public finance campaigns. Do you ever, right? I mean, how close, to, is, that, is that ever going to become a reality? Uh, you know, I, I hope so. I'm an optimistic uh, person. I really hope so. Uh, I think the first step we got to do is uh, overturn the Citizens United ruling uh, from the Supreme Court. Uh, well, the the president's Supreme Court, you're not going to do that. Correct, right. correct. It'll take a while, uh, yeah. but, you know, something that's worth fighting for moving forward. Because, you know, I come from a hardworking family. I come from a low-income family. My parents don't have a million dollars to give to me to run for office. I had to earn my way here. I had to run for the state assembly, knock on every door in my district, ran for state senate, had to knock on every door in my district, ran for Congress, had to take on seven other people in a primary, and then, you know, take on the incumbent. So by the time I got here, by the time I'm here now, I've had to work very, very hard. But, you know, I, I think I put $10,000 in my entire career out of my pocket, and that's a lot of money for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, if, you, if you're running against a multimillionaire that can just put in $10, $15, $20 million from their own pocket, and they have friends that can put in that money, it's very hard to compete. So uh, if you want more average people serving in office, I think we have to be able to have, uh, uh, you know, take, take money out of uh, politics. When I first uh, moved to Las Vegas, we had um, one congressional district in the entire state. Now we have what, one, two, three, four, right? Right. We have four. And we have a census coming up, um, 2020. Right. Right? And, uh, and that means a lot because you have whoever controls the state houses in 2020 control, you know, uh, the allocation of uh, congressional seats and state right. legislative seats, right? Uh, is Nevada um, earmarked to get an, another seat? Do we have enough population, or what do you think? Th that's a good question. Uh, you know, we, our, our growth, so, so for the last 25 years, uh, before the recession, mm -hmm. we were the fastest growing state. Right. Um, you know, I mean, there was uh, projects going on here, housing was going up. Unfortunately, after the recession, people started moving out. Uh, you know, part of the reason is because a lot of those jobs were in the construction industry. When construction right. went away, we lost almost 200,000 people. We're finally in the last two years have started to grow again. Um, if we grow super drastically uh, in the next three years before the 2020 census, right. we may have a shot at a new congressional seat. But the way it's looking right now, uh, if we continue growing at the same pace as last year and this year, uh, I think it's going to be a little difficult. Um, but you're right. I mean, you know, redistricting is very important. You got to make sure that all of the communities are properly represented. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this district is one of the most diverse districts in the country. You know, my district is basically all of North Las Vegas, Northwest Las Vegas, Northeast Las Vegas, and then Central Nevada. I mean, you literally have rural Nevada, urban Nevada, suburban Nevada. Uh, you have multi-million dollar homes in Summerlin. You have Section 8 housing. You have uh, farms and agriculture. Uh, you have casinos and you have farms. I mean, it's literally the entire gamut. Uh, it's 30% Latino, 20% African American, 5% Asian. Uh, this district is a microcosm of America. You know, so for me, again, being able to represent this district, uh, it, it, it's basically being able to represent America. Yeah, and it's a large district, so you, you keep your tires yeah. in your car in good condition. A, a lot of road trips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we have only a couple minutes left. So, mm -hmm. going back to Congress, it's got to be unique that you're a representative from Las Vegas. I mean, you get uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, you know, 
kidding from uh, some of the other uh, Congress people. Yeah. But they all want to come here, right? They, everybody <laughs> wants to come to Las Vegas. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, we've done a pretty good job at uh, educating some of my colleagues um, yeah. uh, on, on gaming issues and mining. Um, you know, they a lot of other states, other representatives, don't really look at gaming in a favorable way. Right. Uh, but here in Nevada, you know, it is our leading industry, right? Half of my family works in the gaming industry. Mm -hmm. So we got to, you know, do a good job at educating them as to why we got to continue uh, strengthening our gaming economy here in Nevada and, and mining as well. Uh, so it's been it's been a tough task, but we all want to we want everybody to come to Las Vegas. You know, we want people to come here, spend some money, and, and have a little bit of fun. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts about how what's going on in Las Vegas? New stadium, football team, hockey team next month starts yeah. playing hockey here. I mean, it's a new day in Nevada. Um, yeah. You know, we we've been trying to diversify our economy for the last seven eight years. Uh, Governor Sandoval has done an excellent job with the uh, Governor's Office of Economic Development. Uh, you know, now we have Tesla here. We had a Hyperloop One. Uh, you know, we have the Raiders coming, the, you know, the hockey team. Mm -hmm. uh, we may have a, a, an MLS team in the next few years. Now we have a USL uh, soccer professional team. Mm -hmm. We're finally growing up as a city, and it's, it's, uh, it's very encouraging to see that because, you know, this is where I want to raise my kids. This is where I want to have my family, and, and, uh, and, and, and the more diverse that we see our economy, the better for my kids and, and for generations to come. You're about, uh, what, 25% through your term? Yeah. Um, you're going to go back after your August recess. What would be the one thing that you'd like to see accomplished between now and your, your full term? So we have a lot of work to do. Um, you know, part of the reason why we have this August recess is to go back to our district uh, and, and check in with constituents. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a, I mean, literally every day right now is packed with events uh, in the district, talking to small business owners, constituents, union members, and so on and so on. But one of the things that I want to make sure that we get accomplished by the time of I'm done with my first term is an infrastructure bill. You know, let's pass a bipartisan infrastructure bill to invest in our economy, uh, to, to invest in our schools and roads and bridges that are crumbling down, especially in rural Nevada. You know, I've been doing a lot of road trips out there. Uh, they desperately need it. And to put people back to work. Uh, you know, this puts people back to work, rebuilds our schools, bridges, and roads, and it's good for our economy. So that's one thing that I'm hoping to work with with the Republicans, uh, and, uh, and hopefully we could get it accomplished. And do you see that happening, being passed in the House? Uh, you know, if once we start talking about it, uh -huh. we haven't really had a substantive conversation about it. I believe that we, we will find some common ground. Uh, you know, there's certain things that you just don't compromise on. You know, I believe that the, the billionaires and the big corporations should be paying their fair share. Um, but by the same token, I think everybody's got to be paying their fair share to make sure that we have something that's good for our economy. Everybody agrees on the result. It's just how do we get exactly. there that, that is the debate. Exactly. Let's and we can get there. We can get yeah. there. But we just all have to be adults, sit down at a table, and come to a compromise. Thank you so much, yeah. Congressman Ruben Kewin. Thank you so Ruben. much. Ruben. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Ed. There are many types of careless drivers. Those who text and drive, drink and drive, and those distracted drivers. If you've been hurt, you need to call me. Enough said. Call Ed. EdBernstein.com.